a quick way to label which fear is good and which fear is bad is that the first type of fear is a rational fear and that fear keeps you alive. The second type of fear is an irrational fear and that keeps you from living. And the challenge is that both of these fears feel exactly the same in your body. Welcome to Borough Business. Mike Blutzer here with Doug Larson. Mm -hmm. And we're actually missing Marcus Gersey today. He's We are. He's in Florida doing something. He's crushing it in Florida. With, uh, with Angelo. Mm -hmm. They're having fun over there. So we stayed back, stayed home, enjoying the uh, beautiful overcast weather. It's amazing. Yeah. June gloom. Here. June gloom. June gloom. Yeah. Yeah. We have our guest, Peter Scott. And uh, you run the Fearless Life Experience amongst a bunch of fearless stuff, right? Yes, I do. Uh, you are a CrossFitter. I am. You train. Where do you train at? CrossFit saved my life, guys. Seriously. Like, I have so oh, yeah? much respect for gym owners. I did not know that, actually. Yeah. So, not officially I, life and death situation. I like to sneak people into the show, and then Doug's like, oh, who's this? Well, I've been here a guy? handful of times, I but I, I didn't know you're a CrossFitter. I mean, yeah. we, we've only talked business at breakfast. Can't you tell? So Check I'll, out this body. <laughs> I don't know about that. So I'll train over at Stratum Fitness in Solana Beach. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Blake and Eric over there are the lead trainers. And we work and with those guys. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. They're, they're hooked up on Barbell Logic, aren't they? Yep. Good. Mm -hmm. And they're loving it, by the way. Good. Uh, they both said hi. Uh, when I was training there this morning. Legit. Uh, right on. But man, I think about like all the years of just weightlifting, like watching documentaries like Pumping Iron with Arnold and thinking that bicep curls and, and heavy bench was the only thing that uh, had anything to do with fitness and then learning movement and mobility and flexibility. And these are all still weaknesses of mine, but I can't tell you, I feel so much better than I did just three and a half years ago when I started. Dude, we, that, we, took really you up, cool. we took you up a level two yeah, weeks ago. Yes, you came did. over. I gave him a bunch of stuff to do. Yep. New stuff. Going through some Max Shank uh, mobility stuff. That's right. I'm in the flow. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I do that every single day, yep. if not more than once a day. For sure. See? Told you it works. Look <laughs> at him. Look at him. He's amazing. Shredded from my five minute flow. There That's right. Go. That's all you need. <laughs> It's a good habit to get into. I think take, taking your joints through a full range of motion every single day is just a phenomenally good life habit for anyone to get into. For Even sure. if they're not like stretching or working out, just it's just it's just movement. It's, it's good for you to move. And having that five minute habit every single day is like you, you can't say you don't have five minutes to yeah. do something like that. Like, Especially with how much we sit in a chair in front of a computer most of the time. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. before I got into the business that I run now, I was an investment banker. So I was working 80, 90, 100 hours a week, hunched over a computer in a cubicle, crunching numbers. Mm. Talk about poor um, foundation, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, one, one of the reasons we're talking to Peter is you used to do that. Yep. Let that train go by. You used to be an investment banker. Yep. And you chose the path of entrepreneurship. I did. And, uh, and now you work with other entrepreneurs and help them make that, that same transition. Yep. And, and even after people have made the transition to being an entrepreneur, there's a lot of things they, they might need to overcome. And, and that's why we're having our conversation today. For sure. I'd really like to dig into that story and how you made that transition. And even after becoming an entrepreneur, like some of the, the things that have happened since then. I'd love to share that. So um, the thing that I focus primarily on with entrepreneurs is mindset is really overcoming the fears, the doubts, the limiting beliefs that are stopping entrepreneurs. I think that's the only thing. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not lacking information today, right? You can hire a coach, you can learn all the valuable information to, you know, master marketing and sales and systems and those things are incredibly important. But if you've got this fear in the back of your mind holding you back, it doesn't matter how great the information is. What? Mm -hmm. So I I imagine a lot of people are thinking, well, I'm not scared. I don't have totally. any fear. Yeah. Why should I be listening to Peter? Yep. So I'll what do you say to that? So for the high achiever who's listening or watching this right now, uh, I always say that fear, uh, stress, stress is nothing more than the high achiever's version of fear. So mm. you may not feel like you have fear, but if you have stress, it's actually the same exact thing which is really hard to believe. Mm. But when you follow your stress and you really go deeper and deeper and deeper into it, what you'll discover is that underlying fear in there. If you look at financial stress, right? And I don't think anyone, doesn't matter what level of success you achieve, a lot of people experience financial stress. Maybe it's not the fear of failing or maybe it's not the fear of success, but at that level, maybe it's the fear of 
losing what they've achieved. Totally. It's more right. money, more problems. Yeah. That's just real. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And here's the other thing. I'm talking about stress that's limiting, right? Because you know in fitness, stress is a good thing. There's good forms of stress and there's bad forms of stress. Mm-hmm. So that thing that I focus on with entrepreneurs is the is uh, distress instead of eustress. Mm. So you're saying stress, but that, that probably cascades over to a bunch of other similar emotions, cat or uh, stress, uh, worry, yep. anxiety, et cetera. Sure. Anything in that category probably is manifesting at, as fear at the, de- at the deepest level. Like yep. fear is the thing that is causing those other emotions to emerge. That's exactly right. Yeah. And the reason why I became so curious about this is because my entire life was consumed by fear. So I'd love to share that. Go for it. Um, Dive in. So, I mean, this goes back way before investment banking. This was when I was 10 years old, and I'm sitting in a courtroom with my grandparents on my left, an attorney on my right, and my mother directly across from me. And at 10 years old, I had to look into my mom's eyes and tell her that I no longer felt safe living with her because of her alcoholism. I mean, just imagine having to do that at 10 years old. Yeah. Having to stand up to an adult, yeah. especially your mom yep. like that yep. and say some real shit. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Terrifying. Right. And at 10, I had no idea what sort of impact that would have on me. But what it did is it led me to make a decision. And this is what happens in our life as we go through events and they could be traumatic. They could cause a lot of pain. And our unconscious mind creates a decision. And what decision I made at that time was that by telling my mom the truth, I lost her love. So that if we take that out, it meant by telling anyone the truth, I would lose their love. And it led me to like become this inauthentic chameleon, this version of myself that I would become whoever I needed to be to seek love and approval and validation from everybody outside of myself. Um, and that led me to the investment banking, Mike, where I, I graduate college and I start my career in investment banking, right? And this is a very demanding career. You're working 80, 90, 100, 100 hours a week. And I did it because I wanted the things that I thought it would bring me, which were respect and love and power. Um, But I thought that I would get them through the material possessions that that career would give me, the suits and the cars and the houses. And what I discovered that it was empty. It wasn't what I wanted to do at all. Um, And the way I left that, there was two significant events. One event was that I was in the office late at night, it was about 11 p.m., and one of the managing directors, who is my mentor, um, he was in the office with nothing pressing the next day. He had no pitch, no meeting that was important. He just didn't want to go home to his family because he neglected them for so long. And think about this as a gym owner, right? As a gym owner, you are running your business six, seven days a week, 12, 14 hours a day, it's very easy to reach that level of burnout, of overwhelm, of out of balance. And that's what I was approaching. And fortunately, I was in my early 20s, so I could see that that was my future. And I was looking ahead and I was like, this is the man man I'm aspiring to become. What the hell am I doing with my life? Yeah. Um, and then another significant event happened. My, uh, I got a phone call from a family member. And uh, they said, Peter, your father's just been rushed to the hospital and you've got to fly home immediately if you want to say goodbye. And his health was deteriorating for many years. Um, He battled alcoholism his whole life and drug addiction. And uh, I remember walking into hospice and looking in my dad's eyes and asking him, Dad, why did you do this to yourself? And why did you do this to me? I was 25. He was 60. You're saying that because he was not taking care of himself? He wasn't taking care of himself, right? So he consciously would neglect his nutrition. Um, And he looked at me and he said, Peter, because I'm afraid. Because I'm afraid of not living up to my parents' expectations because I'm afraid of not being enough. And that was the exact thing that was keeping me in investment banking because I was afraid. I I got approval from family for that career. And when he passed away, what he did is he literally gave up on life and drank himself to death. And that was the moment um, when I made the decision to never let myself, a loved one or anyone I come in contact with, be controlled by fear. And I realized it held me back my whole life and I just became a student. You know, when, when you get to a point of pain in your life and you just decide you've had enough and you've, you've got to find other answers. And yes, those answers are inside of you, but when you don't feel like they're inside of you, you seek outside. And so I saw it through books and through podcasts and through events and mentors. And then I would jump out of planes and hike high mountains and do all these things to experience fear. And what I would notice, and I can get more into the entrepreneurial journey uh, later, 
uh, is that when I would do these things that terrified me, I became more confident. I became more courageous and my financial life would increase. I would make more money as a result of doing those things. Nice. Yeah. Well, shit. I should be jumping out of more planes. I jump out of planes every once in a while. That's true. You got to do I it. do like skydiving. Yeah. <laughs> so, nice. so you're saying that having put yourself in these intentionally, in some cases, very scary situations, yep. you're, you're used to experiencing that sensation, that, that fear, that feeling. And then when you get into intense business negotiations or you have an idea and, and there's a lot of risk involved, like you're comfortable being uncomfortable. You're comfortable being scared. You're comfortable being afraid. And exactly. it, fear never goes away for anybody. Yep. It's, it's how you manage that fear. It's how you is how you behave in the presence of fear that's that's, that's, that's what courage is like it's, yep. it's being afraid and doing it anyway and doing it well and, and actually being able to perform in a state of fear yeah, you Doug, can't ever really get rid of it you nailed it man because i always say you know i've got the book the fearless mindset the event the fearless life experience when i say fearless i don't mean being without fear mm. that's not possible i don't think that's healthy it's having the courage and the confidence to go do that thing that terrifies you. And the thing that we most fear doing is always, every single time, the most valuable thing we could do in our life. There's nothing more valuable than that. And so I'm on this mission to not eradicate fear, because I don't think that's a good thing. It's to almost transform people's relationship with fear so that when they experience it, instead of running away, they actually run towards it. One of the one of my favorite quotes is, fear is the only thing that gets smaller the more you run towards it. I don't mm, even know mm, who said that, mm. but that's the thing. Never is, heard it before. <laughs> Me either. I, I'm being yeah, serious. Yeah, so I don't know who said it, but it's brilliant, and it's very unique in that. Um, and so that's that's what I do for a living now. So what uh, what was what was the transformation like? I mean, you, you're an investment banker. You started seeking out yep. these experiences. I mean, did you did you walk out of that hospital that day and quit your job, or what was that like? Yeah, so I quit uh, within the week when I got back. Yeah, it was very instant, and I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I just knew that wasn't it. Um, and what happened was I got into a conversation with a separate mentor and I just said, Hey, I, I quit my job. I don't know what I want to do with my life. And she suggested I go through a personal development program. It was my first, you know, you know, if you remember back however many years ago, your first experience with personal growth, um, I went through a program in Chicago and it was transformational. And I remember going through these four days and then on Sunday going up to the facilitator and saying, I want to do, like, I want to help grow this company. I want to do this for a living. And I had no coaching experience. I had no sales experience. But they ended up, after about three months of me knocking on the door and not taking no for an answer, um, bringing me on. And they trained me for about four years. Uh, and that was before I actually launched my business. So talk about fear. You know, I teach this thing because it's what I want to learn, right? So I had so right. much fear in my entire life. Mm. In fact, even after leaving investment banking, I wasn't yet ready to become that entrepreneur and leap off that cliff of uncertainty. So I was trained in coaching and eventually got to a point where um, – I had no choice because I diverted my focus. I actually was dabbling with the idea of coaching while working with this company, and my performance fell off a cliff. And fortunately, I look back now, it was a blessing, I got let go. And so overnight, my income evaporated. And I think this is really important for the listener as a gym owner because I didn't know how to grow a coaching business. I knew that's what I wanted at that time, but I had a choice to make. Do I go back and play it safe and tap my network and find a job? Or do I pursue my passion and my mission of coaching, not knowing how to do it? And what I did was I sought mentors. You know, you guys, I listened to so many of your episodes. You advise so much the power of investing in yourself. And I can't agree more because it simply collapses time. Like if I try to build a coaching business from scratch, I couldn't have done it. I invested, I cut a check for 20 grand in my first mentor and did the whole thing, borrowed money, took on debt. But that's sometimes what's necessary to learn the skill sets and to shift your mindset to go get those results that you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we keep framing a lot of this as, you know, we're, we're, we're talking to the person listening, how to manage your own fear. But yep. in the case of a business owner, you're a mentor to your whole staff. And in the case of a coach, you are, you are a mentor and a coach and you're dealing with, you know, all the people in your fitness class that day or CrossFit class or all of your athletes that are on your team, etc. And having the realization that your own mind is in many ways, in part, run mostly by fear. Yep. 
all the people you're dealing with on a daily basis that you're mentoring and coaching, that's what's happening for them too. Absolutely. And so being able to figure out how to how to manage your own fear and still be able to perform and, and, and get out of life what you want to get out of life because you're not being controlled by it anymore, you got to figure out how to do that first. And then once you figure that out, it's your job to pass on those skills to all the people that are in your gym, all the athletes that are trying to make a transformation, all the athletes that are trying to get stronger and perform better and, and lose body fat and whatever their goals are. Um, it's very difficult for them to pursue those goals yes. at their full capacity or their full capability when they're being controlled and managed by fear. It's when, so you're, when, you're, when you're trying to sell someone a gym membership and they're going, ah, you can see they, like, they want to make the information. They're very frustrated. Like, they, they obviously have the money and they're yeah. still like, ah, I don't know if I should sign up. Like, it's them worried about something. It's them worried about making a mistake and paying all this money and then someone coming like, don't you pay like $200 a month to go to that gym and, yeah. and, and it's not working? Like, and they're worried that person's going to think they're stupid for spending all this money and it's not working. Like, there's some fear that's keeping them from from actually signing up and joining your gym. It's not because they don't want to, it's they're, that they are afraid. That's so true. And think about as the gym owner, if there's any hesitancy in you making that offer, that invitation to join, if you're afraid of rejection or you're afraid of you know viewing it as a failure, what a disservice is that to your members, mm-hmm. right? When there's somebody that you know you can completely transform their life and there's nothing more important than health and fitness, There's no, right? The man with, the, with his health has a thousand wishes. The man with... Without it, only has one. So there's yeah, nothing a great expression. as important as that. And, you know, I do a, I do a three-day event called the Fearless Life Experience. And one of the things that I love most about is that on the first day, I take all of the members or the attendees, and it's a really small group. It's 10 to 12 people through, cross, through a CrossFit experience. And I, you know, get the trainers over at Stratum Fitness to lead it. And the reason I do it is because to show and to have somebody experience the breakthrough that's available in their body when they reach what I call that one degree moment. And every gym owner who's listening to this knows what I'm talking about here. It's that moment when you reach this point in your workout where you have a choice. And that choice is to give up because it's too painful, it's too hard, or the choice to dig deeper and find a way to push more and break through that 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 fake limitation that your mind is creating. And when I take my clients through that, it creates a new possibility in their life. They go through that one degree moment, right? That, that degree from 211 to 212 degrees from water to steam. And then they go and translate that into their relationships, into their business, right? How many times do you approach uh, fear in a conversation with a loved one, with your wife, with your husband, with your children? And you feel that resistance and you back away when what's available on the other other side is a breakthrough by pushing through that fear and having that conversation that's most terrifying. What I find interesting is a lot of times those hard conversations are much more difficult beforehand than after. Always. And afterwards, you're like, well, that actually wasn't so hard yep. now that we've gotten through it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a lesson right there. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I feel like it's hard, it's hard beforehand because you're afraid it's going to go poorly. Yeah. Like it's, it's fear <laughs> managing the conversation around fear. So that's really important to realize because <laughs> yeah. like fear doesn't exist in the present moment. Fear is the a definition I once heard is fear is a chaotic projection of a painful future. If you're listening to this, stop driving and write that down. Fear is a chaotic projection of a painful future. Unless you're on the five and then get to your destination. Get out of my way. There we go. And then <laughs> don't block Bledsoe on the five. Just, just when text he pulls it up to yourself you truck, while you're driving. Like, <laughs> if you're afraid you're going to get an accident, don't let fear control you. Just do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, man. Um, safely do that. But that's the thing is that, like, to go back, fear, like, public speaking, for example, mm. um, the the greatest fear of all human beings, greater than death. And, you know, as I'm talking to you, I feel some nerves and I feel some fear. You know, I, I feel really passionate about, like, sharing a valuable message here, and that's coming up for me. And I can choose to label it as fear and let it restrict me, or I can choose to label it as excitement and breathe through that fear. So I share that because when you're public speaking, it's very rare that you're actually scared once you get started and share your message. It's the days, the hours, the minutes that are leading up to that talk. That's where all the fear and the anticipation is. Once you step on stage and get through that first 30 seconds, then you're in flow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I've heard, agree. I've heard something really similar before, where where this person was like getting attacked by a tiger or something, yep. something you know, very intense like that. Where 
as the tiger was running at them, like they, they were like, oh shit, they got they got afraid. But they said once like the tiger got there and like jumped on top of them, then they're just in the situation and they they don't recall being afraid while they were in the struggle. Yep. And I don't remember exactly what happened. That person apparently survived somehow, some way. That might have been at a zoo or like at a circus or the something. The ghost like that, but came to Doug and told him the story, <laughs> the story of the tiger. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they, they they thought that was really interesting. And they when they told, as they told the story, they said that you know fear rarely manifests while you're doing the exactly. thing that you were so afraid of and i in, in my in my own experience like fighting mma like i'm always like nervous the day up but then once they're like you know fight and you walk out there and you, and you start punching and, yep. and all that like I'm, i've never been afraid during a fight no, i've always been incredibly comfortable during the fight you're present that's the thing is when mm. you're present you can't feel fear it's that when you're focused on the future mm. and you know when you yeah that's 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 all i was going to share you can go down rabbit yeah. hole if you want. That's okay. Well, That's I was okay. going to share that one of That's my one of my um, one of the most powerful experiences in my life was actually through MMA. I, I haven't trained MMA at all. Um, the exposure I got to it was through a mentor. I was a, a member of a of a group called Wake Up Warrior mm. with Garrett White, which some of your listeners probably oh, have yeah. heard of. I know that guy. And uh, he was my first mentor. And I remember going to Laguna Beach and having Jesse Elder lead an MMA fighting experience. And I had never fought once in my life so I had so much fear like insane amounts of fear leading up to that but mm-hmm. once I got into that experience of getting punched and like throwing punches there was nothing that I could feel but the present moment like that fear faded away and the certainty and the confidence that I felt after it regardless of the outcome mm-hmm. regardless of getting my ass kicked or not I felt unstoppable by doing that so like that's a really important thing to put yourself in those situations yeah, that's something that I've had a, a realization around lately. Like being in the present moment is what pulls you out of your head. Like it puts you in your body, pulls you out of your head. And so some people do that through, you know, doing MMA, and yep. and it it makes them feel so good that they have this this relatively healthy activity, depending yeah. on how you want to look at it <laughs> for MMA. But like you know, or CrossFit or whatever, where you know if you're competing in CrossFit, like you're in the present moment while you're out there, and, yep. you, and it, it feels amazing to not be to not have the anxiety and the worries of life while you're in the present moment. But that that also coincidentally that concept applies to all these other things like like doing heroin or, or cutting yourself mm-hmm. intentionally mm-hmm. or bdsm while well, you're getting like you know got a ball gag in your mouth and you're getting whipped like that well you need some we intent- all know we've all you know, there. Like, <laughs> that's day two of my event <laughs> crossfit day one bdsm day two so yeah the, the, those those intense physical experiences you might want to like, clear that up that's not true. <laughs> they, they, they pull you out of your head and they, and they 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 put you in the present moment and then just for a brief period of time even though like you know if you're cutting your own arm with the yeah. knife to like you know, to to manage your trauma or whatever yeah. you're doing like that that thing seems very counterintuitive like why would you do that to yourself it's like obviously not a healthy practice but at the same time for whatever reason it's it's letting this person um, not feel those intense um, emotions and and thoughts and feelings just for just for a moment yep for sure and think about I think about the book Rise of Superman by Stephen Kotler when you think mm-hmm. about extreme athletes that big, was the book that actually gave him this realization oh really yeah, enough, yeah yeah so, yeah. so Laird Hamilton the big wave surfers or some of the base jumpers um they're in these life or death situations where they're in this level of flow that you know i haven't seen can be obviously there's there, there's studies of how to hack that right now but the fastest way to get into that is to put yourself in that situation mm. now that is a place where that fear that they feel is a good thing right because they are in imminent danger My name is Jake Sorokman. I'm the owner of Athletics United, home of CrossFit Seek and Destroy. Before working with my business coach, um, there was real no direction. There was no real authority as to what needed to get done and what was going to help us strive to get to the next level. And I think with him, really focused and pinpointed where we needed to go as a business and what was going to help us excel to get to the next level. Since working with our business coach, things have really got put into place. Um, I have a lot more direction as to let my staff know what needs to be done to reach those weekly and monthly goals. And with our business coach, he makes sure it's getting done. We started to see a lot of changes very quickly uh, within the first few weeks of working with everyone. It really helped us organize things so that we were able to do things we love, which is learning the box. We've seen a, a huge success in our monthly membership rates. As were before working with them, we were at about that 10 to 12 members a month. Now within the first four or five months, we're reaching that 20 to 25 members in a month. So just in over four months, we've done over 100 members, which has been huge in, in this time. It's really allowed me as a business owner to not so much step away from the business, but to put more into the business um, 
the things on the back end now being more organized and um, you know just have a purpose of what needs to get done. It's freed up some time with my family to be able to spend extra time on weekends with my daughter and do the things that I generally want to enjoy doing. I would have to say the favorite part about this program has just been uh, the mentoring, the, the, the extra help, the extra hand, the extra guidance. Um, for someone like myself who thought they had reached the top and was able to do whatever they needed to do, these guys just 360 and just taught me a whole new aspect on the business and, and really striving to make it better. I would say anyone out there that's looking to work with Barbell Business, is it, it's, it's a no-brainer. It's something that should be done with every business owner to make their business strive to become what you want it to be. Um, they're going to not only help you along the way, but they're going to show you the tools, uh, what it takes to, to be the best you can be. All right, well, you got into the difference between rational and irrational fear. Yeah, so the two types of fear. So what I was sharing was that uh, a quick way to label which fear is good and which fear is bad is that the first type of fear is a rational fear, and that fear keeps you alive. The second type of fear is an irrational fear, and that keeps you from living. And the challenge is that both of these fears feel exactly the same in your body. So whether you're woken up in the middle of the night to a burglar breaking in your home that fight or flight response, that's, that's a good thing. I want you to feel that, right? That mm -hmm. keeps you alive. But if you're speaking on stage or you're being interviewed on a podcast and you feel fear, your heart beats faster, your palms begin to sweat. Or if you're trying to sell a membership at a you're gym. You're trying to sell a membership at a gym, exactly. Pe people if, definitely have like, oh, resistance they're like, I really that. don't like that. Yep. They fear rejection, right? That feeling, that doesn't keep you alive. That actually keeps you from living, right? That's your lifeblood in your gym. So it's to recognize which one of those are rational and irrational and to know that the only way to overcome the irrational fear is to actually do that very thing. So over time as a gym owner, when you make offers and make invitations and you invest in mentors and you become more skilled in having that conversation, then that fear begins to completely fade away. And it may still be there underlying, but it's so insignificant compared to where it was. Yeah, especially in that situation where by selling someone a membership, you're doing something very good for them. Yep. You're doing something very good for you. You're doing something very good for the rest of the community and the culture. Like it's a win-win-win situation. And if you're afraid to do something that, if it actually goes through, is a win-win-win, then you know that's that's an irrational fear. For sure. Like that's that's not you pulling out, trying to take a left into traffic, and like you're like, oh, there's a gap. I should shoot for it. And if it goes poorly, everyone's gonna fucking die. Yep. Like that's that's the wrong kind of fear. That you should listen to that and not pull into traffic. But selling the membership, like that, that's only a good thing. Yeah, and also going back and shifting your your mindset around the value that you're delivering there, right? Because as a gym owner, it, you can view. CrossFit gyms as more expensive, right, than other gyms. Some people can view that. And when they fully understand the value that they get from a functional movement gym or a CrossFit gym that is so much better than that, what they would get from like an LA Fitness or a 24 hour 24 hour fitness, then it's actually a disservice to not charge a high amount. And that's because we pay attention to what we pay for, right? So if your gym is really low, if you're if you're offering a low price membership, then your members are probably not that committed to show up and to do the work required to get the results that they want in their bodies. You know, when I when I got my first mentor, for example, I have a, a best friend of mine is a guy named Sean Stevenson. He's three feet tall and he's in a wheelchair and he's one of the mm -hmm. greatest speakers on the planet. So I got to uh, have I've you guys interview before. him. Yeah, yeah, so, absolutely. I've, I've so, had dinner with him before. Okay, good. So we got to get him on the show. Um, he he was mentoring me as a friend, right? Teaching me what I needed to do to he grow was my... teaching you how to be a friend? Teaching me how to be a friend. He was a friend tour, actually, like a, a friend, friend who's also oh, a friend. Oh, oh. friend tour. No, he was mentoring me around how to grow my coaching business. Mm. But because I wasn't paying him... I wasn't implementing what he was teaching me, right? Right. Yeah. It wasn't until I cut a check for a significant amount to hire my first mentor. When that mentor taught me the same exact things, I just became more committed because I demanded a return on that investment. Same thing for your gym owners, right? When your gym owner, or uh, same thing for your members. When your members are investing $200 or more a month in their in their membership, you better believe they're going to show up and they're going to put in the sweat to get the results that they want. Uh, so it's actually a disservice if you do charge really low or if you're afraid to charge in the first place because that's what's going to get them to actually show up consistently to get the results. 
Yeah, and if you don't charge enough money for a membership, then quite often you're not going to be able to afford to have the highest quality coaches there to to deliver the exceptional so service true. that you're claiming to have when you charge somebody for a high membership. Yep. So it's 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 a full circle thing. Like if you if you don't have enough capital to actually fund a thriving business, then you can't charge top dollar for it. It's, yep. it's a chicken or the egg thing in some cases. Like how do you do one before the other, which is a, a totally different ball game. But yep. but I definitely agree that you got to be you have to have enough courage to actually ask for the high dollar amount that you're asking for. And if you don't believe it, then and they're not going to believe it either. That's exactly right. And what we do is we let our own oftentimes and 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 I I share this. With, with the listener and the viewer as much as I share it with me. We let our own financial situation limit what we charge, right? We think about mm-hmm. how money is, how we experience money in our own life. And so when we're able to make that shift, we show up more powerfully and more confident. And, and it's really courage, right? Because whenever you increase your prices, it is going to be uncomfortable. It is going to be scary. But by doing that, maybe some people do say no, but you've got to go through those no's in order to get the yes. And once you get that first yes, then it's not as bad. Mm-hmm. So that's actually a rationale in my mind for hiring older people sometimes mm-hmm. as a CrossFit gym owner. Like a lot of people, they hire like 22 year old CrossFit coaches and that person would never have ever thought to spend $200 on a gym membership because yep. they've never made more than minimum wage or maybe they've been in college and this is like their first job. Mm-hmm. They just never had a lot of money before. And so uh, if, you, if you can find someone kind of like yourself, like you used to be an investment banker. Yes. And then if that investment banker who's made, you know, big dollars yep. before comes in and they're just like, you know what? I've, I've done the money thing. I, I have money. You know, I, I live a very stable lifestyle, and now I'm just super passionate about CrossFit. And now I want to be a CrossFit coach just because it's it's a passion project. That person's gonna have no problem spending or asking someone rather to pay two hundred dollars for a gym membership because in their mind, two hundred dollars when you used to make three hundred grand a year is not that crazy. Totally. Yeah. You know, Thirty grand a year or twenty five grand a year, two hundred dollars a month sounds like a lot. Yep. And and think about this: when you come to offering membership, your gym membership, it's not the membership that 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 prospect wants. It's the results that that membership can get them, right? Same thing with coaching. In my coaching business, I'll coach coaches at times and they they try to sell their own products or they try to sell their own coaching packages and that's not what people want to invest in. They want to invest in the results that those things are going to get for them. And when you're able to shift your mindset and learn how to have that conversation, you find yourself double, tripling your pricing. And then what you'll see is your results for your clients are actually going up because they're investing more. Yeah. Peter, what, uh, one of the biggest questions or the most common questions we get yes. is, all right, I own a gym and then I have this job over here too. Yep. And this job feels so safe. So good because it's paycheck. I've got a wife and a kid, two kids, and uh, we got health insurance through this company and all this. But if I give that up and I go full time in the gym, I lose all that. So how do you approach that? Well, number one, that fear doesn't go away until you actually make the leap. So that's one thing that I want the listener to really learn is that like Mm. to wait around for that fear to go away, you're going to wait your entire life and you're going to turn around. You may approach the end of your life with regret. And the one thing that really allows me to move through fear is to recognize that the only certainty in this life is death. And I don't say that to be morbid. I just say that to be real. It shows you how fragile life is. And when you do that, you realize that, that you get to act more decisively in that. Now, what could, what could shave that learning curve and make it easier for a transition is to, number one, set a public declaration, okay, not just to yourself, but to your wife, to your kids, to your family, to your friends of when you are committed no matter what to make that transition. So that it's not only in your mind, but it's the people that you care most about in your life are actually holding you accountable to that, okay? Second thing I would consider is absolutely look for somebody who can get you, who has the results that you want and can get you the results that you want. It was a lot easier for me to grow my coaching business when I had mentors who had the formula, had the results, and could teach me. I could have done this absolutely on my own, but it would have taken me 10 years. Why not collapse time and get it done in six months when you're working with somebody? Yeah. Right? And then just remember this, that I always say confidence is a result. It's not a requirement. So to wait around for confidence, right, you're going to wait your whole life. The only way you gain confidence is through acts of courage. So that means you have to leap off that cliff of uncertainty in a way and recognize that no matter what, when your back is against a wall, you will find a way to create the foundation and the funds for yourself to have a much better quality of life than you ever could if you're doing that job that you're doing now. 
I feel like competence breeds confidence. Absolutely. If that makes sense. So yep. the better you are at something, the more confident you become. And then you get a little more confident because you were competent. And then now the, the buffer or the difference between the two has, has been lessened a little bit. And your competence can improve. And then your confidence will follow. And it's like it's this game where the better you get, the more confident you become. But rarely does someone, is someone actually, even if they have a kind of uh, confidence that they, they shouldn't have, you know yep, what I mean? Like yep, they, they just sure. think Fake they're great for no reason. Yes. They have no confidence. Like yep. still, like they're going to have even more we confidence. Call, we call those people assholes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you are a quote term. unquote asshole. <laughs> 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 yeah. But th those things, they, they go hand in hand. So yeah. uh, if you want to become confident in a lot of ways, you got to just get started and, and get some experience and, and grow your knowledge base and grow your capability. And then the confidence will come. Exactly. And, and, uh, a great term that I love uh, comes from the military is embrace the suck. Whenever you start out at something new, you're you're gonna suck at it no matter what. Oh yeah. Right. When I started at CrossFit, I was horrible. Now I'm not some gifted CrossFit CrossFit athlete now. Far from it. However, I'm a hell of a lot better than when I started three and a half years ago. So I had to go through and embrace the fact that I was gonna be the slowest. You know, I was gonna be the weakest in the class in order to actually gain the capacity to get to where you know each of you want to be. Um, same thing when you think about growing your your gym, right? If 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 you're starting to market your gym and you're trying new things like Facebook advertising and things like that, not new things like no one's doing them, but new for you, then you're going to probably lose a lot of money doing that in the beginning and embrace well, that, the suck. That's an interesting thing. People, a lot of times, they, they run a Facebook ad one time. Yep. And then they the, the, the famous thing is, is they come back and they well, it didn't work. Facebook yeah. ads don't work. And we're like, yeah, you because I, I tested time. 50 bucks a day for five days and it doesn't yeah. work, so I put in 250 <laughs> bucks, right? But it's like I look back and I, I, I don't run a bunch of traffic. I've invested about 20000 Honestly, the first 12 to 15 was me not doing it right, right? And, and like that money's gone. However, it gained the competence to know how to run ads now where now I've got profitable funnels that are filling my events and filling my coaching programs and things like that. But had I given up, Right. So the gym owner listening to this, number one, is either commit to mastering that skill set if you are running it yourself or find somebody who's an expert at that. You guys have interviewed, you know, people, you do that for your clients. So when you when you see somebody who has that skill set and they actually enjoy doing that, focus on your passion of of coaching people in fitness and delegate the rest of that stuff if you really want to hit your business goals. Yeah, for sure. Uh, do you do any one-on-one -on -one coaching I do. with people? Yeah. In addition to the like the live events? Yeah. So a couple different things. I'll do one-on-one -on -one coaching around mindset and peak performance for already like highly successful entrepreneurs. So these are the entrepreneurs that are making a lot of money, but they've done it at the cost of their health or they've done it at the cost of their relationships. So I'll coach them. The other area of one-on-one -on -one coaching is actually coaching coaches. And I kind of came into this... Um, like the reluctant, uh, I think Russell Brunson calls a reluctant hero or something where I've had coaches come out, reach out to me just because they saw the growth of the Fearless Life Academy and the Fearless Life Experience. And so I started coaching a couple to begin with and realized I just had a lot of knowledge around marketing and sales and systems. And so now I have a whole, whole program called Earn 100K Coaching, teaching coaches how to earn their first six figures. Mm -hmm. Now here's the thing. There's a reason why I'm not teaching them how to earn their first seven figures because I haven't done it myself yet. So I think that's a really important key is only coach people on things that you've mastered yourself or you're committed to master. You want to talk about confidence and certainty. You're right. You, you get it through confidence or competence. Mm -hmm. And I always say the fastest way to start charging what you're worth is by actually investing in yourself. It's to be worth it. It's to be worth it. Exactly. Because if you aren't investing in yourself and you don't have those skill sets, then you're not worth the pricing that you want to charge. Mm -hmm. So when, when someone's coaching an athlete, you know, yep. you, a big part of coaching an athlete is having a very close relationship with that athlete, especially if you're working with them on, in, on a, like a one-on-one -on -one setting, you yes. know, personal training, um, remote coaching, et cetera. You know, if you're coaching a group, a group class, it's good to still, yes, have a relationship. But if you have 30 people in your class, you, you, you can't give them the, the attention needed in a 30-minute or one-hour class to really, yep. um, you know, do any type of, like, serious work with them other than just show them some technique and get them to sweat and then they're on their way and then maybe talk to them after class. But uh, if you are uh, working with someone in a one-on-one -on -one setting, there's a lot of trust that goes into expressing what your deepest fears are. Yes. Right. How, how do you build that rapport with somebody and how do you pull out of them like the real fear? Not, not like it. the surface level fear, yeah, like yeah. Oh, the, the thing they say, you know, it's yeah. like, I don't want a gym membership. Like I can't afford it. Like that's not that that's not what's the problem at all yeah. in most cases. Like there's a deeper underlying fear. How, how do you get someone to the point to tell you the truth? I go first. 
So mm-hmm. what I mean by that is I tell the truth first or I, I'm vulnerable first. I share something vulnerably around my fear. When I, when I lead my fearless life experience with 10 to 12 people, you've got to be comfortable in that room to get really raw, right? And get really vulnerable. And so when I open that event, I tell the story uh, even more that I've shared on our interview um, that no one outside of that room has ever heard, but I tell it in that room. And what it does is it gives every other person permission to be vulnerable themselves. So when you lead by sharing that you've had fear around this, you understand that you can relate to them, it builds that trust and rapport. And I'm not saying to do this in a manipulative way, but if what you have truly is valuable, it's a disservice when you don't do this. So when you share that fear, you acknowledge that it's there, you acknowledge their courage for sharing that with you, that they they feel you know some, some, some fear around making this investment, then share that you once felt that too. And here's how you overcame that or here's how your clients have overcame that, right? When you do that, it shows to that person that they're not alone. That's one of our biggest fears is we're going to make a decision or we're going to make a choice that makes us feel alone or look stupid. And when you can eradicate that fear and show that everyone's been through that and this is the results that you get on the other side of that, that's the real value of it. So go first. Then on the other side of that, you know, when someone is not feeling very well because they feel alone or they feel stupid, like that's why empathizing with someone works so well. You know, I was in the same situation. It happened to me. I felt the same way. And then all of a sudden someone feels better. Make sense? Yes. Like it's just coming, looking at it from the other side of the, of the perspective. Like if you're in sales or you're just working with an athlete and they're just having kind of an off day, empathy works incredibly well because you're pulling someone out of that state. Yep, a- absolutely. And, and that's the thing. How do you go deeper and deeper and deeper? Once you establish that empathy, you have rapport. And once you've got rapport, then you can go deeper into the real things that are holding them back because it's often not the fear of the pricing, right? Pricing is never the issue. It's making the wrong decision or having friends judge you for investing $200 a month in a gym. You know, those types of things are what really could hold people back. And when you're able to show that they're not alone in that fear and here's what happens when you make that investment, it just makes them more committed to move forward. So if you encounter someone who at at a very deep level just in like just deep in their soul they they know quote unquote that um showing that you are afraid makes you say less of a man or uh just is not something that that they think is okay to do for whatever reason yep. and they and but of course they don't want to show it because they're afraid of what will happen yep. does that make sense yep. like if if that's the case and someone's just like super resistant to expressing the fact that they're afraid at all how do you how do you let them know that it's normal and that it's okay to express the fact that they are afraid and living in fear so again the biggest thing is is first going first and and sharing that yourself Mm -hmm. and then realizing that how can you get them to share something that they have less emotion around? So maybe something that they feel a little guilt around or a little fear around, but it's not so traumatic that it's easier to do that because once they do that, it creates a small win, right? One thing that I I do, and and I'll share the gift at the end of this interview that I want to share with the listener, is I'll challenge clients of mine to face their fear of rejection by going out and giving unconditional love to complete strangers. Now, this sounds weird, I know, but listen, hear me out here because um, rejection is unavoidable, right? And so what I'll do is I'll have them go to a crowded place like a Whole Foods or a mall and just give unconditional love. It could be a hug. It could be flowers. And what will happen is some people will receive that with open arms and love it, right? While other people won't. They'll be like, what are you trying to sell me? What are you doing here? You know what I mean? And no matter what, every time everyone gets rejected. But once they get rejected, they realize that they still are living on the other side of that. It's actually not that scary. So that's one thing is creating small little exercises for them to share vulnerably, to face that fear. And once they have these small um, admittance in a way, then they feel more courageous around sharing some of the real stuff. This reminds Uh me of how I learned how to pick up chicks. Yep. Is I intentionally drop lines that would get me shut down for a while, like purposely. For sure. And then after a while, it turned into not a big deal to to go talk to a girl yeah. at a bar. Yeah. First first ten years, as soon as the lines <laughs> got rejected, it's like okay, I've got got I've got my reps in. Well, you know, now I'm changing the game. A wise That's man right. a That's wise right. man once said it takes ten years to become an overnight success. So. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're there. <laughs> 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 figured it out. Figured out something. Yeah. We'll see. 
All right. Um, yeah. Where, where do we want to go from here? Yeah, where can people where can people find out more about what you have to offer? So um, and and hey, first I want to uh, we need before and after pictures. Okay. Of you. Oh yeah. Yeah. To show that. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I want people to and after fear. Yeah. No, before it's cross before photo. fat. Yeah, before uh, CrossFit and after. CrossFit. I, I've okay. seen I've seen before pictures of Peter. It yeah. is awesome. Oh my gosh, my so days good. when I was an investment banker because I I was working hundred hours a week, so I was mm. neglecting my health. I was sitting in the cubicle. I was eating processed food and fried foods all night long. It's ridiculous. So I'll send you the photos. Not recognizable. <laughs> yeah. He's a different person. Yeah. I haven't seen it. I would sure. love to see you, it. You look dopey. Yeah. Oh be, yeah. To be nice. I look like yeah. a. Um, <laughs> I look like a f- I look like a fat Napoleon Dynamite. Is what I look like. <laughs> good man. I think that's how I describe it's so it. Good. Yeah. I can't believe I just said that to all of you listeners. Yeah. Um, There's no pickup line that's that, that's totally. getting over that. You want to get no. rejected by a woman? Just say that, and then you'll face your fear of rejection. Um, where to go to learn more about me? Uh, one thing I'd love to do, Mike and Doug, is gift the listener something. And what that is is it's a five-day virtual face your fear challenge. So I just shared one of those challenges of going out and giving unconditional love and facing that fear of rejection. Mm. Um, What I do is I basically send out a short daily video for five days or like five minutes long and challenge each participant to go through and face their fear of public speaking, of rejection, of failure, of charging what they're worth. Um, And so they could check that out at challengeyourfear.com. That's one place to get that. It's completely free. And then if anyone wants to check out the three-day fearless life experience that I lead in San Diego, I am going to do my first international one where we go great white shark diving in the next few months. <laughs> cool. This one's here. I take people out surfing and we go hang gliding and do CrossFit. It's, it's a ton of fun. Well, if you just go surfing here, you're swimming with great, great whites That's anyway. That's true. Why even? <laughs> yeah. Whether you want well, to or not. You don't, need you to, don't even need a cage. You don't need to go international. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's at fearlesslifeexperience.com. And then the last thing would just be my primary website, and that's designafearlesslife.com. You've got a book. Yes. Yeah. So uh, if you want to get a ton of content very affordably, um, I share a lot of actionable strategies and mindset shifts around fear in a book called The Fearless Mindset. And so if you just search that on Amazon, you can find it on Kindle and paperback. Excellent. Cool. Thanks for joining us today. Guys, last thing, you. you have social media? I do, yes. Instagram. So if you search Peter Scott IV, as in the fourth, you can find me on Instagram, on Facebook. You'll see pictures of me. Yes. Sometimes. See Mike and I hanging out quite yeah. a bit. <laughs> Very cool. Thanks, Peter. Awesome, guys. Thanks for having me. All right, later.